Okay, this part of the elbow anatomy lecture is going to talk about actual joint structure. Um, so we've covered all the bony anatomy, we covered all the ligamentous anatomy, now we're going to talk about how it all works together. So um, we're going to have three different names for the three different joints that we have at the elbow. There are three different joints. Um, each one is the name of the joint is going to tell you which two bones are working together. So the first one here is the humeroradial joint. Sorry, humeral ulnar joint. Um, and it's going to be where the humerus and the ulna go together. And this is going to be what we think of as the true elbow joint. Because um, this is where the majority of our flexion and extension is going to come through. This is where the trochlea of the humerus is articulating with the uh, semilunar notch of the ulna or um, the overall olecranon of the ulna. So we have the trochlea up here in front, and again it has um, an indentation where that's going to actually accept the trochlear semilunar notch that runs along the inside of the olecranon. This is a hinge joint. Um, there's only one degree of freedom. Um, degrees of freedom, I'm not sure if you guys know what this means. You should know what it means. Uh, degrees of freedom is which planes of motion, um, how many planes of motion can this joint move? Um, so if you have one degree of freedom, you can only move in one plane of motion. If you, like the shoulder, the shoulder has three degrees of, of freedom. We can move in the frontal plane with um, abduction, adduction. We can move in the sagittal plane with flexion and extension, and we can move in the transverse plane because it has uh, um, internal and external rotation. At the humeral ulnar joint, where because the olecranon is wrapped around the trochlea of the humerus, it's only capable of doing one motion. So only flexion and extension occurs at the humeral ulnar joint. And that's what we consider one degree of freedom. The next one is humeral radial joint. So this is where the humerus and the radius come together. So the capitulum of the humerus and the radial head, those two are going to join together at the elbow, forming a second joint, making up the elbow joint. Based on the anatomy and what the, what the radius is able to do, it has two degrees of freedom. It's able to move in two different planes. So at the humeral radial joint, we have flexion and extension, because as, as the olecranon moves in the flexion and extension, the radius is going with it, and it's traveling around the capitulum. We are also able to do supination and pronation, which is going to occur in the transverse plane. We're able to use the capitulum as a pivot point. So we have a very round structure, a convex structure, here, and we have a concave structure on the radial head. So because those two are going to, because of how they're made, we're able to actually have that some sort of rotation going on there, and that's where the supination and pronation occurs. So the humeral radio joint has two degrees of freedom, flexion extension, and supination pronation. Together, we're going to get an overall hinge joint for the humeral ulnar joint, um, and that's what we think of as the traditional elbow joint we think of flexion and extension occurring there. Um, supination and pronation does occur, but we tend to think of that more as a forearm movement versus an elbow movement. So when you think of the elbow, really think of the humeral ulnar joint and the humeral radius is just coming with it. Um, so the elbow itself is kind of a broad term, making up the humeral ulnar joint and the humeral radio joint, but that's considered a hinge joint. Um, only allowing the one degree of freedom in flexion and extension. These two joints, because they're so close together and the radius is pulled right next to the ulna and both are pulled very close to the humerus, um, they are encapsulated in an entire joint capsule. So these, they're not separate joint capsules for these different joints. They're all together in one big giant joint capsule. Then we have our radial ulnar joint and there are actually two radial ulnar joints. Um, we're only talking about one, so specifically here, we're talking about the proximal radial ulnar joint. So radial ulnar joint is where the radius and the ulna come together, so where those two touch. There's two of them because there's one up here proximally where the radial head is sitting on the radial notch of the ulna. And then distally, we'll talk about next chapter, but we have the um, radius and the ulna here. We have an ulnar notch on the radius distally. So we're talking about the proximal radial ulnar joint, but there is also a distal radial ulnar joint that we'll talk about um, in the hand and wrist chapter. This is, um, so the radial ulnar joint together, there are two articulations, the syndesmotic or the syndesmosis or interosseous membrane, all those things, the syndesmotic membrane, syndesmosis, or interosseous membrane, 
really are all the same kind of thing, so they can be used interchangeably. Um, it's going to allow for one degree of freedom. So this proximal radial ulna joint is where the radial head sits up against the ulna, so it's on the radial notch of the ulna, and the proximal part is going to be the pivot point. The radial head is going to rotate, but it's not going to actually move. So in this position, this is when we are in anatomical position. So looking at these, how the two bones are aligned, the radius and the ulna are parallel in anatomical position. The, in anatomical position, you have your forearm in supination. Um, when you go into pronation, the radial head stays in place. The radius, the radial head does not move position, but the actual radius rotates over. So the radius is going to start here, and then it's going to rotate over, and then you're going to end up getting a cross um, when you do go into pronation. So your bones do crisscross when you're in pronation. They are parallel when you are in supination. Um, that pivot point here is the radial head and the annular ligament working together to keep the radial head in place. Distally, um, where the actual movement of the radius occurs, um, there is a disc in there that allows that movement to occur. So again, supination and pronation is more of a forearm motion where the elbow, we talk about just flexion and extension. So technically, supination and pronation really isn't part of the elbow joint. It's more of a forearm motion. Uh, so supination is your palms up, pronation is your palms down. When we go to measure this, we normally start in this position. So this is our neutral position down here, like the thumbs up position. And then we measure it. Um, when you go into supination, you have about 90 degrees. And then when you go into pronation, you have between around 80-ish, 80 85, depending on um, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. But you tend to have less pronation than you do supination. And again, the different picture that you can see that when you're in supination, the two bones are parallel. When you're in pronation, the radial head stays where it's at, but the distal radius actually crosses over the ulna. Uh, we also have bursa of the elbow. Uh, we talked about bursa as fluid-filled sacs. They're there to help reduce friction. Um, we do have a, two of these that we'll talk about in the elbow. Uh, the first one is subtendinous olecranon bursa. So if you just sound that out, subtendinous means below the tendon, and it's on the olecranon. So it's actually going to sit between the olecranon, the actual bone of the ulna, and between the, the bone and the triceps tendon. So it's going to be deep. So it's going to be underneath the triceps tendon on top of the bone. The next one is going to be more superficial. We have a subcutaneous, which means under the skin. The subcutaneous olecranon bursa is going to sit between the olecranon and the overlying skin. So here is our um, subcutaneous bursa, and here is our subtendinous bursa. So this one's going to be deeper underneath the tendon. This one's going to be sitting right between the bone and the skin. These two. Um, Specifically, the subcutaneous olecranon bursa is very prone to injury because it's just between, it's just on the bone, and it's a, it's an area that we tend to hit a lot. If there's a lot of direct trauma to that bursa, it is um, very commonly ruptured, and you get a lot of swelling um, very quickly from that ruptured bursa. Um, you can also get bursitis, but again, it's not the chronic stuff is not near as common in the elbow as it is elsewhere in the body. We also have what we call the carrying angle of the elbow. Um, your arm is not perfectly straight, so where the humerus and the radius and ulna meet, it is not one straight line. Um, the radius tends to be a little bit shorter than the ulna, or it is shorter than the ulna, and how they line up with the humerus is going to give you a specific angle at the elbow. Um, so this angle is what we call the carrying angle. It is formed by the vertical axis of the humerus and the vertical axis together of the radius and ulna. So we are actually able to measure the carrying angle. So we're looking at the vertical axis, so a straight line down the humerus, and then a straight line down between the radius and ulna. So if you wanted to actually measure this, the fulcrum of the goniometer would go in the middle of the elbow, you know, kind of right on that crease in your elbow joint. Then the stationary arm would go straight up the, ul the humerus to your shoulder, and the movement arm would go straight down to toward the middle of your wrist. Um, there is no movement occurring here, it's just how you carry your arm, so the movement arm and the stationary arm aren't going anywhere. So you can measure this um, just by putting your goniometer in the right position. So if we did it on this person, here's the fulcrum right here, then we can just put one arm straight up toward the elbow, I'm sorry, toward the shoulder, 
the other one straight down toward the wrist, and then we can actually assess what that angle is. Um, carrying angles tend to be larger in females, um, most of the time just to because females have larger hips. So as the hip comes out, we have a natural larger carrying angle to accommodate the hips, the position of the hips. Um, so women's normal carrying angle tends to be 10 to 15 degrees, where a male's carrying angle tends to be 5 to 10 degrees. So anything more than that or less than that would be considered somewhat abnormal. Um, this is something that you're going to want to know. Um, overall, you might want to, if you see that it's very large or very small or uneven, you might want to assess it. But overall, it's something that we're not going to tend to measure, but you just do need to know what is considered normal. Because there are things that are not normal. Um, sometimes you can have an increased carrying angle, and that is called cubitus valgus. Uh, cubitus valgus is this picture down here, where we have a larger than normal carrying angle. So when we measure the angle, um, it's larger. And then this one is called a cubitus varus, also called a gun stock deformity, where you have a carrying angle kind of the wrong way. This is, you'll see this, the cubitus valgus, way more often than you'll see this. This cubitus varus is due to a bony deformity. Um, I actually had a friend in Hawaii who had this problem, and when she was a kid, she had a fractured radius, and it was at a gross plate, and her radius stopped growing. And if you can kind of picture what's going on there, if the radius stops growing, the radius um, is going to be on this side, the ulna is going to be on this side, so if the radius stops growing, it still has to touch the wrist and it still has to touch the elbow. Um, then you can have a longer ulna, or maybe the opposite occurred, where you have a fractured ulna and it stops growing and you have a longer radius and that might be pushing it in. So usually these excessive deformities are due to um, some sort of trauma to the radius or ulna while growing. Um, usually a growth plate deformity. Uh, but growth plate fracture leads to these deformities um, where the, the structure did not heal correctly. So not overly common, but you do want to pay attention if you do see these to know what they're called. Cubitus valgus is an increased carrying angle, and you can remember that because it increases um, what a valgus force would be. Um, like I mentioned previously, a valgus force is a force from the outside in. So a force coming this way is going to help stress the structures on the inside here, so that's going to increase your valgus force, where a varus force is from the inside out, um, giving you that cubitus varus. So that's what the um, the names go with them. And then we have cubital recurvatum. Uh, this is going to be excessive extension in the elbow or hyperextension in the elbow. Normal extension is going to be zero degrees. So full extension should be zero. Anything more than that can be considered cubital recurvatum. Um, and that can be considered hyperextension. This is more common in females. Um, you tend to have a little bit more joint laxity. It could be a result of injury. You could have a less less proce less developed electron non-process. Who knows? Um, but whatever reason, joint laxity is probably the primary one. Where normally this is, you know, zero degrees of extension. Here you can obviously see she's got a lot more extension in her elbows. Again, could be symptomatic. Could not. It really just depends on the person. Um, just a side note here, cubital, hopefully you picked it up by now, but cubital is always going to mean elbow. Um, whenever you see cubital anything, we're going to have cubital recurvatum, we'll have cubital varus, cubital valgus, um, we have our cubital fossa, we'll have a cubital tunnel. Whenever you see cubital, always think elbow. That's going to go together. And that finishes up this section.